Good evening, everyone. I think we have quorum. So uh, I'd like to call the um, Special Committee of the Whole of the 14th of December 2021 to order and acknowledge that the meeting is taking place on Ancida Algonquin territories. I would like to thank the Algonquin nations for hosting this meeting on their land. I'd like to call for a mover to um, and a seconder to approve. Or, no, this is committed. I'd like our call for a mover to approve the agenda. Trustee Boothby, thank you very much. Are there any changes to the agenda? And seeing none, I'd like to call a question. All those in favor? And opposed? And that passes, thank you very much. Moving on to matters for uh, discussion, report 21-091, sense of belonging at school. And I'd like to call upon the director to introduce that report. Madam Director. Uh, thank you, Chair Penny, uh, and through you. Uh, tonight, we do uh, bring to you a discussion report for um, regarding the sense of belonging at school. Uh, the data um, that has been compiled through our um, identity-based data collection project that was undertaken in 2019 has resulted in a series of, um, of uh, reports uh, that give some sense-making to what the data means in terms of impact on practice. Uh, and so tonight, um, led by um, as Executive Officer Giroux um, and the Reed team um, with Ma Manager Archeski and uh, a number of members of the team are here with us tonight to take us through that report uh, and to entertain uh, questions from trustees uh, around uh, impact uh, and next steps. So at this point, um, and as always with my great thanks uh, and appreciation for significant um, work, both uh, elbow grease and intellectual work, um, I really would like to um, uh, extend my appreciation to the group for undertaking this project and passing over the presentation uh, to Executive Officer Daru and uh, Manager Orocheski. Executive Officer. Thank you very much, Madam Director. Uh, and uh, through you, Mr. Chair, we're delighted to be here today. Uh, as uh, Director Williams-Taylor indicated, we are joined by Manager Joan Orocheski and by Research Officer uh, Vitanchov Vitanchov. Uh, and I'm not sure if Sait, Research Officer Sait Detas is also with us or not. I can't see on uh, the small screen. But uh, I just would like to start by giving a, um, a huge expression of thanks to the entire uh, Research Evaluation and Analytics Division. We have been working through this um, identity-based data and uh, challenging ourselves in our learning and uh, in our understanding. Uh, and in our working with community. And um, we've been working with a, um, a third party expert on uh, using equity data. And um, this team has not only um, uh, done uh, uh, several, a whole series of um, really rich reports, but uh, they have worked through them and worked through them and are uh, leading this work in the province. And so uh, it's a real privilege to work with them on this and to watch um, the growth we've seen uh, over the last year. So tonight we are excited to present the um, Sense of Belonging at School report. And in this report, we're thinking about how do students um, feel about their connection to school? And does their sense of belonging at school um, vary across demographic characteristics and identities. And what are um, the things that students think are important for contributing to their sense of belonging? And this area is so intricately tied to some of those strategic goals um, we have set for ourselves in terms of uh, creating a culture of caring um, and uh, our idea of advancing equity and sense of belonging at school. And uh, much of this work and those priorities in our strategic plan are tied to our OCDSB Indigenous Equity and Human Rights Roadmap. And so you will hear us uh, making some references to some of those things. And so um, definitely, you know, we think about um, building connections in, with, with this kind of data and looking at where there are disparities and disproportionalities in the system in doing that. So I'm going to hand it over to Manager Orocheski and her team to lead you through the presentation. And uh, we um, 
have kept the presentation very short, knowing that you've had time to read the report and hoping that we allow as much time as possible for you folks to answer questions and uh, expect that many of those questions um, are things that we might respond to either by the research team or by um, any of our colleagues who are um, engaged in the work in schools in terms of affecting some of the change. So thank you and over to you, Manager Orczewski. Uh Thank you, Executive Officer Giroux. Um, Mike, if I could get you to advance to uh, slide three, please. Um, thank you. So I'm just gonna walk you through um, some of the highlights and key findings uh, of what we found in the report. And so this slide really provides an overview of how respondents rated their or their child's sense of belonging at school on the Valuing Voices survey. And findings were, have been fairly consistent with what other research uh, has found that sense of belonging tends to decline in adolescence. Next slide, please. Results also indicate that a sense of belonging at school may be experienced differently by students based on personal characteristics. This slide shows, and I know it's, it's quite small, uh, on the left-hand side, uh, the di disproportionality indices for each group of students that we examined. Uh, the top part looks at the trillium demographic variables and then the bottom uh, sections are the uh, four identity categories that we have been uh, examining in our reports thus far, looking at Indigenous identity, race, disability, and gender identity. And so while this slide focuses on students in grades seven to 12, and we're showing on the right-hand side, the students who had the lowest proportions of students who reported a strong sense of belonging at school, we do see very similar um, results for students uh, in our JK to six panel uh, as well. And just as a reminder, uh, these are disproportionality indices. So a value of one, I don't know if you can see my cursor on the screen or not, but a value of one, um, which is about uh, two thirds of the way across uh, the screen is parity where you see no difference. So lines extending to the right, show higher proportions of students uh, reporting strong relative to their um, representation in the population and lines extending to the left of that uh, value of 1.0 are the uh, groups of students who have the uh, greatest um, uh, disproportionalities. Next slide, please. So what stands out and is different in this report compared to the previous reports is that we did analyze the open-ended uh, text question uh, for the rating scale of sense of belonging. Respondents were asked to indicate uh, what has contributed to their sense of belonging if they reported strong. And if they selected low or moderate, they were asked to indicate what would contribute to a greater sense of belonging in school. And so for this report, we focused only on the low and the strong ratings, so kind of those polar ends, if you will, um, to try and um, ascertain what the, the um, commonalities were across uh, the two survey uh, respondent groups and cohorts, as well as the um, uh, ratings of um, uh, sense of belonging. So there were 16,522 um, responses uh, for those anchors alone. And we've shown in the table here how those uh, mapped out according to the survey type and um, uh, rating. And what we found uh, was there was quite a bit of commonality um, in terms of the themes that emerged uh, through our analysis. So while the rank order of themes uh, differed across the groups, um, things like support uh, from educators, parents, family, and peers uh, was rated as important. So for example, the importance of having, having opportunities to talk to educators to get support and encouragement for their learning and well-being, but also support from other students in the school. Social interactions and interpersonal experiences at school also contributed uh, through um, uh, greater recognition, acceptance, respect, collaboration, tolerance, and equity. Learning experience as connected to the instructional practices in the classroom, such as teaching, 
uh, methodology, content, learning material, assessment, and evaluation. Relationships in this case refers to a feeling of connectedness or similarity with someone. So it could be uh, friends, peers, education, uh, sorry, educators or administrative staff at the school based on particular uh, interest, background or other traits. School staff, whether educators um, and support staff were recognized as instrumental in creating an environment that promotes a positive sense of school belonging through communication, engagement, providing care, and creating a welcoming and inclusive learning environment in classrooms. For parents of children in JK to grade six, um, the notion of diversity and representation, so the presence of identity-based differences, uh, such as ethnicity, religion, culture, tradition, race, gender, sexual orientation, was identified as something that would contribute to a greater sense of belonging for their child at school. And so um, that um, uh, mapped out um, the analysis in the report. Wanted to draw your attention that we did not, uh, you'll notice, uh, disaggregate uh, all of the comments and themes in the report itself uh, by identity, but we were purposeful in the selection of the uh, quotes to use as examples, trying to hone in and honor the voices of those um, individuals who identifies in, identify in ways that were most marginalized. And so something else that the READ team is working on and hoping to put the, the finishing touches on shortly is a public facing dashboard that will allow users to be able to drill down into specific um, uh, identity categories that we've looked at and tease out which themes um, emerged most frequently for that uh, particular identity category. And so we uh, did bring the concept to uh, our technical advisory group in September and uh, got some feedback and have been working since uh, that time to make some, uh, some revisions to that. So we are hoping that early in the new year, we will be able to also add that as a, as a tool to, for the public to, um, to dig deeper. At this point, I think I will turn it over to Superintendent Simmons um, to talk about some of the uh, next steps and strategies uh, that have been identified to uh, promote a greater sense of belonging in our schools. Thank you very much, uh, Manager Orszewski. Um, so some of the key initiatives planned or being undertaken to support a uh, student sense of belonging at school include a focus on healthy student and educator relationships and nurturing social emotional competencies. Our work with the third path draws the very clear connection uh, between well being and student achievement and we know that students do not develop a sense of belonging and well being uh, through lectures and presentations, but the third path third path, uh, excuse me, integrates well-being and achievement, and it centers the importance of authentic intentional relationships uh, and also sets the eight conditions that establish the educational environment foundation for all students to flourish. And belonging is one of those conditions, but I wouldn't want to separate it from the other eight conditions that work together to establish that foundation, along with things like safety and identity and so on. And we're working closely with the equity team to ensure that our work uh, as educators centers student identity at all times in all ways. In addition, uh, we know that not only celebrating uh, uh, diversity, but also ensuring diversity and representation is a key determinant in a student's sense of belonging. So ensuring that there's a greater focus and integration of diverse histories, contributions, and perspectives that they're present throughout the curriculum will help ensure, to, will help ensure that students see themselves as important members of the school community. Uh, students hearing and probably more importantly seeing through our actions that I see you and that you matter uh, is critically important. Uh, but so too is the uh, importance of students to be able to see themselves reflected in the staff members and educators who are working with them. And I believe I'm turning it now over to uh, Superintendent Farish. Thank you very much, Superintendent Simmons. Yes, indeed. So just to continue on with the key strategies and next steps to support a student sense of belonging at school. 
We also wanted to speak to you about the, the networking opportunities that are available for students to get to know each other and connect on a personal level. Those are both in the classroom um, as well as in the classroom. And it means incorporating activities that involve interaction amongst students, for instance, during group work, collaborative assignments and projects and extracurricular activities. We also are committed to tackling some of the institutional barriers that impede the sense of belonging at school. So for example, those include developing and implementing the equitable recruitment strategy and providing staff training in indigenous knowledge and rights, anti-racism, anti-oppression and human rights. And those are just, a, that is just a small sample. And back over to you, Manager Orichesky. I think that uh, wraps up our presentation for this evening. And uh, at this point, um, through you, Mr. Chair, I guess we can open it up to questions. Thank you very much, uh, Manager Orcheski, and thank you very much to all the presenters. Uh, we do have some questions, at least one uh, trustee, and that is uh, Trustee Lyra. Go ahead. Hi, I'd like to thank you for the report. Um, so my first question is, how accurate do you think this data is of the student population, given that I think we had less than 40% of students respond? So as I've uh, mentioned in uh, previous reports, when we brought information forward, uh, when we first uh, brought the June 2020 report, we did look at external um, um, sources of data to understand uh, the percentage of respondents that we had in our system uh, for race, for example, compared to external sources. And from that um, perspective, we did not feel that there were any uh, particular groups of students that were necessarily underrepresented in the information being brought forward. So are fairly confident that we have, um, uh, you know, sufficient voice from um, a broad range of our diverse student population. Um, what I was thinking is that we might be Self, the students who choose to answer our survey may be students who have self-selected and are generally satisfied with school, for example, because students who are generally satisfied with school might be more willing to answer surveys put in their inbox. Um, and so I'm wondering what we have looked at moving forwards to make future surveys have a more complete picture of the district. So sorry, uh, Trustee uh, Lyra, I, I misunderstood your question. So um, certainly that's something that um, we always uh, have a challenge with. Um, it's very rare to get 100% uh, participation in, uh, in any survey, but certainly one of the um, expectations of our community is that we are using uh, the results from these surveys to affect change. And by doing so and demonstrating uh, that we are taking um, their uh, input uh, seriously and um, taking action to, to make change, we're um, expecting that we should uh, in, be able to increase response rates uh, in future administrations. And also looking to uh, try and identify with communities um, what other mechanisms uh, might be able to support and promote uh, survey completion in the future. I wonder if um, Manager Orcheski might explain a little bit uh, the administration process for students in this age range uh, so that uh, people have a better understanding of how the survey is uh, distributed and uh, when and how students complete it. Um, so in this particular uh, survey, uh, parents of children in GK to grade six completed uh, the survey on behalf of their child and were encouraged to um, include their child in, um, in responding to those items. And links were sent directly to uh, parent emails on file in our student information system. 
Uh, for students in grades seven to 12, uh, we facilitated uh, through the schools uh, in school completion. And so that's something that we've done with our school climate surveys in the past. And um, uh, of course it was at a, an unusual time as well. Um, we were in the midst of a, a labor disruption at that uh, point in time, which may have um, impacted um, some of the um, uh, completion rates. So I used to do work with the Youth Services Bureau and one of the mechanisms that they found was particularly effective at getting higher survey completion rates was um, gift card swapping for complete surveys. And I'm wondering if, or remuneration for completed surveys, I'm wondering if any consideration has gone towards that as a mechanism towards achieving, if not 100%, then close to 100% survey completion rate. Uh, we had not um, uh, considered that for our um, latest round. It had been, it had come up in uh, conversations in the past, and I know through the Ottawa Carlton Research and Evaluation Advisory Committee, we tend to discourage um, honorariums for uh, completion because sometimes it can be perceived as um, uh, coercion. And so certainly not something that uh, will will completely take off the table, but um, you know, possibly consider for uh, future. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Trustee Lyra. And moving on to Trustee Campbell. Oop, there we go. Uh, thank you very much for the report. Um, really interesting to uh, go through. Um, I have, a, I guess, a, a couple of questions. Uh, it's noted, obviously, that um, sense of school belonging is related to uh, well being. Um, and I guess, which is um, uh, an aim, certainly, of uh, uh, the district and for uh, Ontario education. And it may be an unfair question. Tell me if it is. <laughs> but I guess what I'm wondering is, <clears throat> what percentage of well-being, do we have a definition of well-being? And what percentage of well-being is a sense of school belonging? How do the two relate? Uh, obviously, they're related. Um, but in a school context, is it, it, can we really only grapple with sense of school belonging or can we go beyond that? Is sense of school belonging need to be paired with mental health? I just like to understand how staff are, are perceiving a sense of school belonging vis-a-vis -vis the general concept of well-being. So through you, Mr. Chair, um, I, we tried to convey in the report that uh, sense of belonging is quite complex and quite broad. And so um, I would argue that well-being is also very much so. So I, I don't think you can pinpoint to a single um, correlation coefficient, if you will, and I'm not sure if that's what you're getting at, uh, Trustee Campbell. Uh, well, you'll that, that helps, that helps. Basically, they're both very broad generic terms, so I would suspect that there's uh, quite a bit of overlap between the two. Uh, yeah, yes. okay. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, another question is, um, uh, do we have, uh, we have correlations uh, between uh, these things. Uh, do we have evidence of causality uh, anywhere, and um, I'd like thoughts on that. The simple answer to that would be no. No indication of causality. Uh, certainly, um, correlation looking at relationships is um, the, the best kind of uh, outlook that we can uh, look at with the data and the way that it was collected. Great, thank you. Um, when I look at the Annex uh, 2, it seems, if I'm interpreting it correctly, the interpreting the table correctly, <clears throat> it's, it seems to me that some of the most worrisome scores are amongst the uh, 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 spec ed population and the uh, uh, trans uh, population, and I think gender fluid. Um, and so it uh, strikes me that uh, uh, if we wanted to, uh, in a uh, given we always have finite resources in terms of training and, and dollars and everything else, um, it strikes me that uh, it would make sense for the district to really target 
uh, uh, those those students. Um, is is that the staff plan? Uh, I guess my concern is if we adopt a, a broad brush uh, recipe for the entire district, uh, then um, equality obviously is not equity. <laughs> and I wonder about the targeting. Through you, Mr. Chair, I'm not sure that I'm the um, the right person to be responding to this uh, to this question. I don't know if there's someone else, um, a superintendent, who might be willing to uh, to weigh in on this. I can chime in for part of it. Um, certainly, and I mentioned the work that we're doing with respect to um, the third path, um, and that would be targeted because it talks about uh, what are the specific things that an educator can do in terms of developing an intentional relationship uh, and what actions can they take that will best meet the needs of students. Um, so when we think about students with special education needs, uh, as we get deeper into our work with this framework, um, the notion is that uh, you would intentionally focus and differentiate your response uh, uh, to support those students who are demonstrating most in need, but I want to really highlight not to the neglect or uh, not to ignoring the others either. Um, but you, uh, you definitely would, uh, you talk about relationships and what do people, what do students bring uh, to the table, what's their lived experiences, and using that formulate uh, uh, your approach to developing intentional authentic relationships with them that help uh, reinforce them seeing themselves as students in the building or in your classroom rather. Thank you very much, and I'll, I'll like to see how this goes, and I'll follow up uh, uh, later another uh, time. Final question, I'll try and sneak it in here. It says I have 35 seconds, but it's the clock's not moving. I'll take advantage of that. Uh, the, um, and, and that is, uh, in the report, it refers to, to uh, uh, budget spent special uh, funding uh, provided by the, uh, the province. Um, and it seemed to me, if I understood reading through that, that that funding is more or less exhausted at this point, I guess, and I guess my, my question is, what uh, what is the funding picture going forward? I see 18,000 for training um, in a targeted way, but that doesn't sound like very much. Uh, so I guess what I'm wondering is what kind of uh, dollars investment are we looking at uh, uh, in terms of trying to move this forward? So I'll start um, and the manager can step in or the CFO if they want. Uh, we have um, uh, been very successful in uh, obtaining funding from the um, ministry for the work uh, that we've done on in terms of identity-based data collection. And for the last little bit, we have um, uh, mainly used that uh, on staffing resources during the survey collection itself. Obviously there were collection costs. Um, though those funds, um, Although they're still special purpose, they're pretty regularized now the way they've uh, transferred to the ministry. So we have um, uh, tried to regularize our resourcing as well. And so that's currently offset with ministry funding. There may be a delta there at some point, um, but it seems that the ministry has got uh, an interest in this. What um, I think um, is the issue in terms of next steps uh, and it's not unlike any other area of resourcing is there are always a lot more places you could go. And the question is, do we invest more in the research side and keep going down um, different paths? Or do we say we've learned enough from this data and we need to invest our resources a little bit more heavily in terms of some of the strategies to deal with it. So that's the kind of balance we have. Um, and I guess the last piece I will say is, um, we made a commitment to the board and to the community when we undertook the survey um, to make a decision about what the refresh cycle would be um, once we had worked with the data. And um, we've not yet made that decision. I think we're starting to understand some things. There's lots more places we could go. But in the next um, 18 months, we'll have to make a decision about what that cycle is. And, uh, and so there may be... Um, some increased collection costs at that time, depending on how uh, we do that. Although we have already acquired the software infrastructure, et cetera. So hope that gives you an overview. Great, thank you. And I guess this feeds into the budget discussions to come soon. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Trustee Campbell. Moving on to Trustee Boothby. Uh, thank you, and uh, thanks for this report. Uh, very good. Um, I'll just take off a little bit on uh, Trustee Campbell's last question. Um, I also was wondering when we were going to do this again, and I was particularly interested in following cohorts so that we we can look at um, students as they migrate from elementary school into high school, although I do see in the report, and it really doesn't surprise me, that um, uh, high school students are have lower scores in engagement than um, elementary schools, but I would like to see us follow cohorts and see that the measures that we are putting in place are actually having some kind of an impact rather than we just every time have fresh data. Um, so I'll just leave that there. Um, my first question is, um, it seems to me as I look at what the N numbers are in the uh, appendix survey, and then I go back and look at our enrollment report, and unless my math is really pathetic, it looks like about 83% of our high school students actually responded to this survey, which to me is fantastic but unfortunately only 21% at the elementary level. Am I way off on that? Through you, uh, Mr. Chair, um, I haven't done the calculations lately or gone back at the uh, grade nine to, to 12, if that's what you're referring to secondary, because we did the, the seven to 12. So I, I can't uh, confirm uh, your calculations at this point. Um, we did have a 62% uh, response rate for grades seven to 12. And I do know that in JK to six, we had a lower uh, response rate. So it is feasible that we did have a lower response rate for um, uh, grades seven and eight, uh, particularly those that are in the elementary panel, but I don't have a, an exact figure, Trustee Boothby. Oh, okay, so if my calculations are kind of right, I, I actually am happy to see that we have gotten a significant number of high school um, kids that have responded to the survey because if they're the least engaged, I think it's best that we're hearing most from them in my mind anyway. Um, I had another question on why it actually was seven to 12 that were responding on their own and it was JK to, six that had to have the parental input um, because I was thinking down to at least grade four, maybe we'd actually see uh, a better response rate and, um, and a more valid response rate if we were actually asking children rather than parents. I know when my daughter was kind of in that four to eight age group, uh, it was like pulling teeth to get any kind of an answer out of her. So is that a provincial requirement that that survey is split into those um, categories or is that a choice we made? Uh, that was a choice that uh, we made um, at the time of uh, collection. And we made the choice to be consistent with um, the, the 2011 collection that we had done, but also consistent with the way in which um, our school climate surveys uh, had been um, administered and reported on in terms of district level results to have that JK to six focus and seven to to 12. Um, on a move forward basis, at least at this point right now, there is direction um, being given to school districts that are just undertaking uh, this work um, now in preparation for the mandated collection by January of 2023, that parents of children in JK to grade eight will be uh, completing a survey on behalf of their child and students in grades nine to 12 will be completing it. And so um, there are several boards like ours uh, that are wondering about comparability of uh, data moving into that next cycle if that, um, if that requirement stands. 
Okay. I think that's unfortunate for what I have said. Um, I guess my last question, then I'll go back on the list is, um, I like the steps forward, but one of my questions is in the meantime, while we're trying to hire more dis diverse staff, what's our strategy for helping children, uh, students be able to identify with those that are in front of them? Are we going to look at field trips? Are we going to look at bringing um, additional staff in, like perhaps elders, um, that kind of thing? So I'm happy to start there. Uh, I think there are others who may be able to jump in. I think um, we've got a, a range of strategies and you see that in the roadmap. Um, certainly, um, uh, if you think over the last uh, four years or so, we've done some significant staffing of our um, Indigenous um, uh, uh, group working uh, with Indigenous students and um, getting to graduation coaches and um, uh, instructional coaches. Um, so uh, that's one way. And, and, and that's the staffing and not the activity because I think you asked about both and that occurs on both sides. Um, similarly, uh, you know that we retained uh, um, uh, black graduation coach as well. Um, you see some of the work we're doing uh, in the creation of FACE with families and schools engagement and thinking about um, community development and how we reach out. And so that's both the connecting with kids, but connecting with families as well, right? And community partners and building those relationships. So um, I think that uh, in previous reports, we've touched on quite a few of those strategies and they're well uh, documented in the roadmap, but uh, those are some of the ways and uh, I'm not sure if there are others who want to um, add to that. Chair, if I may um, respond to that as well. Um, one of the things that is really important also is to um, think about how it is we're leveraging the experience in classrooms. Uh, and so we know that our students are particularly attached um, and influenced by the educators who are in their spaces on a regular basis. And some of the work that's happening through the third path is how it is that we engage educators, uh, whether they are teachers, ECEs or EAs, and understand their role in building those connections with, with young people who may appear to be in an invisible or may appear to be um, disengaged and how to deliberately create the conditions for their engagement. So that is to say that, yes, there's the addition of um, staff who are representative, there's addition, addition of opportunities um, that might be more engagement, but there's also the building of the capacity of the people who are there um, for building those those relationships and creating those conditions. And that's a part of the training, the professional learning. Um, and I know that in the opening comments, um, the connection to uh, equity and inclusion, um, Indigenous ways of knowing and Indigenous rights, um, those pieces are raising the capacity of our staff to recognize the work they need to do to create those connections as well. So I just didn't want that to be overlooked. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Director. And we're going to go to uh, uh, Lily Miller. Go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, yes, this this is it's good you have this data, mind you. Um, it's it's disappointing that it's taking so long to even just have this report. Um, you know, it was, it's years ago that we had. Um, some OCDSB administration come and talk to the uh, Indigenous um, Advisory Council about matters such as this. And, and you know, we gave our suggestions, um, having staff that are representative of us is key. And here we are uh, going into 2022. And um, yes, it's good that there are the, the, the Indigenous staff support, but talking about having in every school diverse teachers, diversity in every school. Um, and it's a bit frustrating to not have any information, any, anything right now to, to know that there's progress with this. Um, not just diversity with, um, you know, racial diversity, but 
I don't remember seeing any, any te very many teachers with physical diversities or, or trans teachers, you know, like we, I just feel that, that this is not groundbreaking where we are right now. And, and to say that, that um, to suggest that the money might, might be used for more research rather than, you know, let's implement some strategy strategies. It, it, it's not, it, it wouldn't be um, hasty because this is not a new, you know, there's research already been done. This is not a new subject. Um, I just want, I want things to start moving. It is what I'm asking. Um, um, so what, what I'm asking is, is with the diverse teacher uh, representation in the school, is there, is there any data about that? And uh, when, like, how are we gonna track that? Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure if um, executive officer you wanted to begin uh, the response to that. And I do see that uh, um, uh, Superintendent McCoy is also here. Go ahead, uh, executive officer. So I was just going to acknowledge the um, uh, comments made. Definitely, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of work here and it's complex work and, and there is a lot of uh, supporting research. Um, and there's also some data that's uniquely ours here. Um, but the um, uh, member is correct in that um, we shouldn't be so vested in research that we're not running at a um, on strategy at a parallel track. And I think uh, that we've certainly been working to do that. That's what the roadmap was about. But also in terms of the data, um, we did recently collect um, uh, uh, data, employee demographic data. And um, we did a presentation on that at our last meeting. And I think Superintendent McCoy is here and can speak to um, what some of that data looks like. Uh, thank you. Um, and uh, yes, as um, uh, Ms. Giroux indicated, uh, we did do a, um, uh, a staff uh, survey uh, at the um, last spring and uh, did do the presentation. As part of that uh, survey, we did collect identity-based data on our staff, um, and we did present some of those highlights at our last meeting. Uh, we are in the uh, in the process, as we had indicated, of um, uh, looking at that data more carefully in terms of being able to draw a comparison between the um, staff demographics and our student uh, demographics, as well as the, um, the local community, so that we have a better sense of the um, representation of staff um, uh, broken down by different employee group and uh, by different identities and uh, uh, we'll be providing more information on that in the coming um, weeks and months. Uh, in addition, um, as uh, trustees and members of the Committee of the Whole are aware, it was over the last um, year or so that uh, we had a fairly significant change in the province with respect to uh, hiring practices, and that uh, was the um, uh, repeal of Regulation 274, which was uh, a regulation that dictated fairly uh, rigidly the hiring process uh, with respect to teachers, at least. Uh, and as a result of the repeal of that regulation last year, uh, the board approved an equitable uh, hiring policy um, uh, and uh, staff has developed procedures to go with that and working uh, human resources, working with our principals and managers and uh, hiring supervisors um, uh, at implementing uh, the um, components of that policy and that procedure uh, toward the objectives that were identified um, more explicitly in terms of um, um, diversifying our um, Employee, employees and uh, ensuring that the processes that we have in place are um, objective and um, uh, conducted with a, an equitable lens uh, aligned with the uh, principles that are set out in the in the roadmap and in our strategic in our strategic plan. Thanks, Superintendent McCoy. And uh, through you, Chair, I just want to add another piece uh, there for Ms. Miller's um, consideration, uh, because I do know that this uh, question was also uh, raised uh, in uh, ACE. Um, it's the, the piece around the responsibility we have to not only um, do a better job at the data collection um, of uh, our employee groups uh, so that we are able to measure the, the improvements uh, around diversity and set targets for that work. Uh, 
uh, but we also need to do a better job around building the confidence um, of our um, staff to identify uh, because we do know um, that we have situations where uh, because we know uh, people or because we are engaged in the in the selection process ourselves um, through narratives that people share some aspects of their identity which demonstrate that they are members of um, uh, groups uh, that may be uh, what we call equity seeking groups or indigenous rights groups um, but that's not publicly known uh, and so um, people may not have the confidence in the system uh, to self-identify in public ways uh, and so that representation is not counted and publicly seen uh, although it may become imminent uh, through conversations so there is the responsibility to gather the data but there's also the responsibility that we have to build the confidence of our staff members to be able to identify themselves and feel confident uh, to identify themselves um, in terms of a public facing piece. One of the things that um, is happening to grow that confidence um, is supporting um, uh, uh, staff um, affiliate groups um, where we do see that there are growing numbers of staff that are now uh, engaging in um, identity based um, groupings uh, where they have networks um, that are supportive um, and networks where their narratives and their experiences can be exchanged um, as an asset to each other and to the organization and to the community. And so that is emerging and we're hoping that we are able to support that in a way that helps our employees to feel um, more confident about the fact that their identities are in fact valued in the organization. Thank you for that. Um, my other question, my, I just wanted to comment on, on the last, I think was the last person who spoke and um, she said that, you know, we'll look at the student population um, to guide the representation of the, the staff, the teachers. Um, and I, I, I would like just to note that um, let's say, for example, 60% of the students are, are not a racialized minority um, or 80%. You know, I, I'd really like to um, not base it on uh, necessarily the percentages, but really push forward with creating a really diverse uh, atmosphere in the schools for the kids. And it's just to note that, you know, the staff are, are getting together and and having those spaces. And that's it's just it's just more um, more more proof that, you know, students need that same thing. So thank you. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing some changes soon. Thank you very much. And we're moving on to Trustee Scott. First, first of all, thank, thanks very much for this report, which I, I found very interesting. Uh, one thing, though, that I have a lot of difficulty sorting out is what our real findings are with regard to students who come from socioeconomically disadvantaged homes. Um, they, they cross all of the different groups that we track. They include Indigenous and Black and uh, special education students. Uh, and they include a lot of students who we would see as, quote, our regular kids. Um, and it's not something that is necessarily visible or easily discernible. Uh, but when we break out all of the data, uh, we're breaking it out for some groups, but we are not uh, having a, a specific look at what it actually means to have a sense of belonging in school when you are, are the child who doesn't always have a lunch to bring, when you're the child who may be dependent on the breakfast programs, when you're the child who doesn't necessarily have the means to join the field, the special field trips or other other activities, um, 
And and so my question to through you, Mr. Chair, to staff, is when are we going to actually have a good look at the impact of poverty on our students? So uh, to, through you, Chair, uh, you're getting a resounding silence because we do not have um, an active uh, an active plan that is specific to that. Uh, we do know that um, for much of our equity work, we have included a conversation around um, uh, socioeconomic disadvantage, um, and that is an emerging area. Just today, um, we did work uh, on our um, upcoming um, and soon to be presented to trustees human rights policy. Um, and and our human rights equity advisor uh, advised us that it is in fact something, an area that the um, human rights, the Ontario Human Rights Commission is now undertaking to include uh, and name. Um, and so we will see uh, some of that represented when we bring forward our, um, the human rights policy uh, to trustees and to, um, to the public ultimately. Uh, that said, there's a, a large body of research around um, uh, the impact of experiencing poverty on outcomes for students, but it is challenging to consider how you collect that data uh, because there is um, one of the key pieces, in, of course, just like in all other uh, equity, um, equity uh, seeking um, conversations and uh, conversations around identity, we consider dignity. Um, dignity um, is is one of those uh, is a very very key piece uh, when we're talking about issues of uh, poverty. And even using the terminology uh, is um, it, there's a great deal of caution there. Um, I my comments to Ms. Miller earlier uh, reference the notion of visibility of identity, and certainly we recognize that um, issues of poverty uh, influence identity and can be very people spend a lot of time actually masking that um, and take little pride in that identification. And so how we act with them um, in a dignified way to identify that work is, is very, very challenging. Uh, so while it is that I can't say to you in all honesty that we have um, a strategic plan that's specific uh, to the areas of policy uh, of poverty, um, we certainly have looked at and are considering how socioeconomic realities um, usually more as a community or as a neighborhood, uh, as opposed to as an individual, uh, inform how it is that we engage our, our, our work uh, in a better way. I appreciate that response. I think that it is just, just problematic uh, that within, in, in any class of students, no matter what the makeup of that class from the perspective of the groups that we that we ask uh, to, to identify specifically. Uh, what, what we have is usually a significant number of those students who in one way or another may, may uh, come from, from uh, families that simply can't afford everything. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of overlap with the other data, but I do think that there there needs to be some specific and special consideration to to uh, socioeconomic conditions uh, in terms of something that is not visible to to any of us, uh, and it's not something that is easily admitted in a survey uh, because there is stigma attached, and yet. I'm not sure that we have yet figured out a way to really help all of those students to belong in school and to feel that they belong. And so I hope that, that we can give some thought to that going forward. Thank you very much, Trustee Scott. And moving on to Trustee Huff. Hi, just some random thoughts and I'll try to, try to keep them all together. Um, the first one, I'll start just in response to um, uh, Chair Scott's um, comments. The, there is data available, of course, through um, Canadian census data surrounding postal codes. And so the ability to do correlational research 
around postal codes and this data is a possibility if you wanted to use um, very general um, social data that is available and readily accessible to, to researchers. Um, following from that, another research type question, um, you know, if we have boards across the province looking into these, these very same questions at the very same time, the value of um, accumulating that data into one set of data for meta-analysis, you know, notwithstanding regional differences, which, which could be interesting. It could be interesting to group same size cities, say, in, you know, pairing cities and, and looking at that sort of thing. It, it gives a, a much larger N, which is, allows us to have um, stronger uh, faith in the findings that are presented to us. And uh, the last thing I want to say is that um, Lily literally took the words out of my mouth, actually off my telephone, because I was actually typing them at the same time. Um, it is absolutely time to recognize that research has been done. That I don't think any of us were surprised by any of these findings. Um, it really is time to start acting. It's, it, and, and we are. We do have a roadmap, but it really is time to pick up our feet and get running with this. You know, if we want to refine our understanding of things, that's terrific, but it has to happen in parallel with some sig significant action on the ground. So that's my two cents on all of that. Uh, no point, uh, unless anybody has some great uh, response, there's, there's no uh, serious question in there. Thank you, Trustee Huff. Um, I see no one raising their hand to response. We'll move on to Trustee Bell. Great, thank you and through, and through you, Chair. Um, I also want to uh, echo uh, what was just said by Trustee Huff and also um, flag that I really uh, appreciate uh, that Lily came forth and, and said uh, the time is that now, or at least that's what I interpreted. Um, I, I did hear that the staff uh, said that uh, ACE and IAC, I believe, will hear uh, more about the uh, staff survey presentation soon. So I'm pleased uh, to hear about that. Uh, and then when it comes to actually taking action, or at least in, in policy wonk land, my question is, last budget, uh, we set aside uh, funding for a policy analyst with special with a specialty in, in an equity lens uh, to help uh, uh, Executive Officer Giroux in, in revising and, and writing policy and I believe procedure. And so I guess my question is, uh, how will the findings uh, from this report be integrated into uh, our future policies and procedures? And I also appreciated uh, that I heard uh, the director say that it is, um, uh, I believe she said it is time to, uh, to make targets um, and I think uh, this report gives us a, a good sense of, of what success uh, could, could look like. And so I just wanted to express my appreciation for that. Um, uh, I don't know if the answer to how these findings will be implemented into policy uh, will, uh, will transpire, but I just wanted to note that I really hope uh, that it will, uh, that when we say we're applying an equity lens, this is type, the type of research and data and findings uh, that we are referring to uh, when making uh, future decisions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Trustee Bell. Moving on to Trustee Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you. Um, I'm, I just wanna say, um, some of this discussion um, is a bit, for me, a little bit uh, brings up some emotion. Um, won't be a big surprise that I get emotional, um, but try and not let that affect my decision making. Um, what I will say is um, when I went into social work, I remember the very first course I took very first lesson I had in, in that, uh, in my program. And the professor said, if you make assumptions about people, you're going to make mistakes. So really, and I think I've tried to carry that to this day. When I meet somebody, I try not to make any assumptions. It's, it's, it's hard and, I, I, and we all do it. Uh, 
I'll say I even still do it. I won't speak for others because I try not to do that either. Um, and I, I can safely say in this group that it would be not a big shock to anybody listening to this conversation if I say I'm a lesbian, because this is a safe place for me to say that. I don't think I necessarily quote, look like a lesbian. Um, and I can tell you when I go uh, and I've worked throughout this entire pandemic outside my home at various positions, I am not, I do not share with many people in my current job that I am a lesbian. And there's a reason for that because I don't feel safe. And I can talk about my daughter, which means to some extent, I get some heterosexual assumption because I have a daughter, I must be heterosexual, right? People make that assumption all the time about me. So I would be really wanting people to reflect that we can't make assumptions about people. Diversity is not always seen. And I'll tell you one quick, and I got to go quicker. Um, when I first got elected, so I, I got elected, obviously, in whatever, October, I was sworn in December, I went to the Rainbow Youth Forum, and I always go to the staff breakouts. And there was a person there, and I'll use the word person, not to identify their gender, and they were in tears. And what, the reason why they were in tears is because they didn't feel safe to put their family picture on their desk. And I said, I would sit here until that person felt safe to put their family picture on the desk. And every time I haven't seen that person because I haven't been in person to a rainbow forum to ask them. But the next time I see them, I'll ask them. And for those people who say, we haven't made progress, we have made progress. We will continue to make progress. Everybody is doing the best that they can under very difficult circumstances. But I think um, to say we haven't done anything, I think does a disservice to the people who have worked in the OCDSB, who are now retired, some of them, but to the people who have, who have been here for years, we have made progress and I honor everybody who has contributed to that progress and I look forward to doing more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Trustee Blackburn. And we did have, uh, oh, well, go ahead, Trustee Fisher. Yeah, thanks, Keith. I just wanted to jump in at the end. Um, really appreciated the report in this discussion. Always find it fascinating. Um, the work that you do, Joan, and, and the rest of the team, um, and just the insights that you're able to, to generate um, about our student population and our, our employees. And as you've heard me say, uh, I think in the past, as we sort of look at this data, these, these insights, um, these very important insights and how that translate into our own strategic plan or into our own sort of board programming, I still get the sense that you know, we have got so much data and, and I'm, I still struggle with is, you know, how is that then translating into, you know, sort of a real program, a real initiative, um, you know, redirected investment, a call for new investment in, in order to address, I think, some of the real issues and gaps that, you know, we're seeing coming out of this data. So that's, that's question number one is where do we bring this data, the intersectionality data that we have, the employee data we have, and really trying to make some some meaning, uh, put some meaning to it and some directional guidance to it in terms of the very real work that we're trying to do as, as a board. Um, so that's the first question I have for the team. The second question I have for the team is that, you know, the school board doesn't operate in a, in a, in a vacuum in, a, in, a, in its own space. And with a lot of these issues that you've identified over the year, um, you know, in many respects, it's about how we build community. Right, and it's how do we interact with um, city services? It's how do we interact with, you know, police? Uh, sorry, not police, provincial services and federal services, as part of building community. Because we know that we can only go so far in addressing socioeconomic issues inside of a school, and that, on some level, you need to deal with, um, you know, the the other the other. Um, you know, causes and effects of, of these issues, you know, at home in, in, in the community, which requires us to work alongside other partners. And so I guess the second question I, I want to ask you is, is how do we then sort of move this conversation outside the school board um, to work with these other partners to really have 
an impact on, on changing the conversation and, and changing the direction of some of our communities. And I just raised the, the, the idea of a raised school, which I'm sure we don't call that anymore, but you know, my, my, my kids go to a raised school, Roberta Bondar. Um, and I know that there's a lot of work that has to happen in this community. Um, and so, you know, are we working with our community partners to say in 10 years, you know, we want this to be a leading community, a leading, a leading school. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure I'm using all the wrong words and I, and I apologize for that. Um, but how do we work with our community partners to really extend outside of our, 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 our schools and our walls to, to really uh, be part of building community and addressing some of these perhaps systemic issues for the, for the longer term? So those are sort of two overarching questions I have for you. So great question. And I'm going to start, uh, and others may want to jump in, but I'm going to start with the second question uh, and the concept of community, uh, because I think it's very important. And um, our uh, strategic plan is um, really connected to that idea of community uh, because it's built around three culture statements. And so it speaks to community within the organization and it speaks to community in the broader sense. And um, I think that um, in the um, trustees' comments, um, you know, we identified several formal um, arms of community. So, you know, what does the community look like in terms of the school board or um, the city of Ottawa or the provincial government or key partners? Those are all big, big partners that we play with. Um, and, and we continue to build relationships. And then we have a whole host of other kinds of partners um, that are um, community groups, not-for-profit agencies, some of them older, more established, some of them newer, um, uh, and up and coming and, and changing. And so I, I think what we have to look at is um, where do we see ourselves with those groups and, and how does that present? So last week at um, board, we touched on the fact that, um, you know, the district was recently acknowledged as one of about, uh, oh, I think it's probably about 27 members of the COVID-19 uh, response table, right? That was really targeting, um, you know, we talked tonight about intersectionality and poverty and um, that COVID-19 response table was really about getting those who are, at, those who are most marginalized. And that was a community-based um, initiative, all kinds of partners coming together. Um, uh, we meet uh, monthly with the, uh, I'm going to get the name wrong, Joan, the Ottawa Equity Roundtable, a group of um, uh, organizations, academics, institutions, uh, public sector organizations who are um, spending three hours once a month talking about the equity work that they're doing and trying to learn and build uh, on the work that uh, we're doing together. We have, in the case of this research, um, the tag team that um, are people who are experienced with data, but who are representative of different community groups and the nature of those community groups differs quite a bit. Um, we've got uh, different kinds around him. So I think all kinds of ways, um, and that gets reflected um, uh, back through uh, both formal and informal partnership pieces. And I'll come back again to the FACE initiative, the family uh, and community engagement, because I think that gets um, at um, a shift in direction where we're not, uh, we're adding to all of those um, formal community partners and we're expanding that to get um, to more grassroots community organizations. And I think that's really important because that's where we might get folks who are traditionally less engaged, right? And that might help to shine a light on some areas or some strategies that do things differently. So uh, I'll leave that part of community there and how we're working. I hope that's, there's lots more examples, but I hope that gives you an overview. Um, and so how does that um, translate when we come back to our strategic priorities um, in two ways. One, um, if you think about our strategic priorities um, and the, the fact that they're built around culture statements, part of that is that culture um, uh, that we're building in terms of social responsibility and as a community partner um, uh, in town. So I think that's important. But the other thing is reporting back on that. So how do we take this, and this was an earlier question, how do we take this data and uh, report back to you. And I think 
um, in our last strategic plan update to the board, we talked a little bit about um, where we're at in the strat plan cycle and we fed back, you know, the work that we're doing to implement uh, change versus the outcomes of those change. And so I think that's really important because all that relationship building and, and making those changes comes in those first two years. And then hopefully we start to see the measures um, in, in the outcomes in different places. So hope that's um, getting at a lot of uh, um, what was in those two questions and gives you an indication of the breadth of the work we're doing. Yeah, no, thanks, Michelle. And and I think a great topic of the conversation for our retreat, because there's such a, a, a lot of important work that is interwoven in everything that that you've presented tonight. And I think that that's where we can make some real gains in terms of student well-being and student achievement. Thank you. Thank you very much, trustees. And seeing no further hands up, I'd like to thank everyone for a very, very comprehensive report with uh, all sorts of good information and I thank uh, the uh, trustees for some uh, and the committee members for some excellent, excellent questions and analysis moving forward. But um, with that, we only had uh, one item on our agenda and we have come to the end of it. So um, uh, with that, uh, I'd like to uh, say that uh, we are adjourned and we will, um, for some members, we'll reconvene in our board meeting uh, moving forward um, as soon as we can. So thank you very much and have a good night, uh, Committee of the Whole. I think we've only got a couple of people who are still in the meeting who um, should should be leaving the meeting now. And I think we're good to go.
Good evening, everyone. I would like to call this meeting of the board to order and acknowledge that we meet this evening from many places in the unceded and unsurrendered traditional territories of the Algonquin Nation. We thank the Algonquin people for hosting us on their land. Could I have a motion to approve the agenda, please? Trustee Blackburn, seconded by Trustee Schwartz. Is there any discussion on the agenda? If not, I'll call the question on the agenda. All those in favor? And opposed? And the motion to approve the agenda is carried. The next item that up is delegations. And this evening we have four minutes regarding a uh, provision of mental health care. Um, this, this being a four minute delegation, there will be a clock on the screen so that uh, you, you can see how, how much time you have remaining. Uh, when you come to the end of your delegation, there will be the opportunity for up to three questions from trustees for clarification. Uh, so I will say welcome, Mr. Welcome, Mr. Jan, and uh, please go ahead when you are ready. Uh, thank you so much. Can we share the presentation? Great. Um, so, hello. Uh, my name is Fez, as you know. Um, I'm for, I'm the co-chair of the Peace of Mind Coalition, and I'm talking to you today about uh, a report that we recently released called the Provision of Care. Um, this is a report uh, that goes through findings on on how we can have better mental health care policy for students, and I sort of wanted to present this to you in the context of the OCDSB. Uh, next slide, please. Right, so the report has six policies that uh, go towards uh, addressing men mental health care. Uh, it also has costs and budgetary savings associated with the policies. And then the goals of these is basically to ensure that students have access to mental health care, um, that there's a destigmatization of accessing mental health care, and then to make sure that teachers, students, and others can identify barriers to wellness. Uh, next slide. So these are the policies that we prescribe. Some of them are, most of them are prescribed for the provincial level, but a lot of them are applicable even at a uh, board level. So for example, providing 26 sessions of therapy annually, providing one annual mental health check-in for every student, um, uh, you know, developing uh, training for teachers to uh, identify mental illness or, or better training, though uh, I, I understand that this is already like partly taken care of, and then uh, mandating that professional mental health care workers that are hired uh, take uh, culturally response uh, training for culturally responsive summary. Next slide. So across Ontario, this is uh, what the costs look like. Um, we looked at five different models of uh, care provision. Um, the most important ones being insurance provision, which is just covering costs that all students would have uh, or all students who would like to access care would have. And then um, the secondary student, uh, secondary school delivered program, uh, which is provided through schools uh, and through school hired uh, therapists. Um, so as you see, costs become relatively, or, or costs peak at year four, and after year five, they become relatively steady. Um, uh, next slide, please. In the context of the OCDSB, this is going to be serving roughly 15,000 students per year by year five, uh, four. Uh, and of course, this increases every uh, year with population increases. Um, 7,300 students will no longer need care. So we'll have graduated the program uh, by year four. And then uh, the, it'll also go into hiring 159 therapists, um, six care navigators, and two program administrators. Next slide. So say, we also took into account savings, as I mentioned before. Uh, this is addictions treatment, um, unemployment, uh, like corrections programs. Um, and, and this uh, all went at a provincial level to um, break even by year seven. Next slide. 
in the OCDSB, um, the, the budgetary savings are just going to be the replacement of the old system, uh, which costs roughly $6.2 million per year. And you'll see that like costs go over that, uh, but there are also economic benefits. So for example, 10,000 students, uh, additional students will no longer require uh, you know, care in the future after graduating the system. Um, there will be reduction in unemployment of future students, reduction in substance abuse cases, et cetera, et cetera. Um, next slide. So um, I've given, I've submitted a report to all the trustees, um, and the report or, or the executive summary of the report goes through what the implications are. And I encourage you to read the full report if you can, though it's a bit long. Um, but hopefully, you can take that into account when developing future mental health care policies, um, because the, even these changes can go a long way to improving the quality of care for students. Um, and, and if the OCDSB can start a pilot program, that would go a huge ways to improving the condition of students. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation and for, for the uh, material that you forwarded to us in writing uh, to supplement the uh, form you submitted in the first place. Are there any questions for this delegation? Trustee Campbell? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the, uh, the work. It's an interesting perspective. Um, uh, long thought that the public school system is an ideal platform for uh, uh, health um, uh, outcomes improvement, both physical and, and mental. Uh, I, I do, with respect to your report, though, I do have a, a, a question. Um, uh, has there been um, uh, sort of independent, as it were, verification of the, the numbers and the, the projections you've used, or, or how have you sought to validate those? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. So we ran this by uh, multiple economists, policy analysts, um, their, their names are at the at the back end of the report, so you can uh, contact us. We also ran this by um, certain uh, advocates and, and uh, especially advocates of um, like equity policy regarding uh, people of, of different communities to make sure that uh, they're considered. Um, but we recommend that like equity uh, impacts are, are further research in the future. So we went through the normal process of, you know, making sure that um, a uh, all the numbers that we're giving are realistic. Um, so costs are high side co or like high end co or like they're going to be on the high side um, and then savings are like roughly where it should be. Um, uh, right, so we give that in the report um, and then we made sure that uh, that it all follows through uh, with multiple sources. Cool, thank you very much. Of course. Are there any other questions for for this delegate? If there are none with the indulgence of, of uh, the board, I, I do have one question for clarification. And that is uh, whether, whether you represent a particular group or organization in bringing this forward and are you uh, bringing it forward to other school districts uh, and to the provincial government as well? Yes, so um, uh, I, uh, I don't represent any other organizations other than Peace of Mind, which is uh, intended to do non-biased research. So we went into this uh, and we go into like in the start of the report, it goes through why these policies uh, work well um, before going into like these are the considered, these are going to be the costs, these are going to be the savings. Um, in terms of reaching out to other boards, yes, again. So uh, we've reached out to uh, Hamilton Wentzworth, uh, the Toronto District School Board, um, uh, York Region District School Board, um, and of course OCDSB, those are the ones that uh, we've gotten a response for that we either already have presented to or we will present to. Um, and then uh, the provincial government as well, we've reached out to them and we're working on that with them to hopefully um, get somewhere close to implementing this policy, uh, both with the uh, Ministry of Health and with the official opposition. Thank you very much for your response and thank you very much for coming this evening and sharing this information with us. Thank you. Moving on then to the next item on our agenda, I will ask Vice Chair Penny if he could provide the report from board in camera.
Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. So the board met in camera early this evening and reports and recommends as follows on a motion by Trustee Jenkins, which I will second, that staff proceed as directed in board in camera with respect to a financial matter. And we have had our debate in camera on this. Uh, so I will ask um, if um, Manager Guthrie could please open the vote. For you, Madam Chair, it's going to take me one moment just to set the vote up. And uh, everyone should see the um, vote and be able to vote by eScribe. And we have a result. The motion is carried 11 in favor, none opposed. Trustee Penny. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And on a motion by Trustee Jenkins, which I will second, that staff proceed as directed in board in camera uh, with respect to a human resources matter. And again, I will ask if Manager Guthrie could please open the vote uh, for a recorded vote on this. And again, we have a result and the motion is carried unanimously, 11 in favor, none opposed. Anything further, Trustee Penny? I know, Madam Chair, that concludes my report from in camera for this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. And moving on then to uh, the briefing from the chair. Uh, let me begin by saying how wonderful it has been to hear about so many schools across the district holding food drives, raising money, and hosting other initiatives for charities and community organizations. Thank you to our staff for teaching children about kindness and giving back to the community, and a huge thanks to our students and families for your generosity. As the days grow shorter in the last months of the year, we have many celebrations. Although the lights of Diwali and the joys of Hanukkah are now behind us, the celebrations of Christmas and Kwanzaa are still to come. As the end of the year approaches, many of us are also thinking about New Year's resolutions. As a district, I hope that all of us will be resolving to work hard to advance a culture of caring, equity, and inclusion in all of our schools, making them safer and more welcoming, free of bullying, discrimination, and racism in 2022. On behalf of the board, best wishes for a safe and restful winter break for students and staff alike, and a good return to school in January. And I see no questions coming up here, so we will move on to the director's briefing. Madam Director. 
Thank you, Chair Scott. Uh, looking ahead to January, the uh, OCDSB is preparing its annual kindergarten and secondary school registration campaigns. We'll be hosting virtual parent information sessions across the district and launching um, an advertising campaign. More information will be shared in the new year about this campaign. Uh, a reminder to families that Friday, this coming Friday, December the 17th, will be the last day of school before the winter break. Uh, school will, res will resume, uh, is expected to resume on Monday, January the 3rd. Uh, students and staff are reminded to take their personal belongings and materials home on Friday. During the break period, all schools will be closed. OCDSB offices will also be closed from December 24th until schools resume on January the 3rd. I hope everyone in our community will take some time to rest, relax, and recharge. Uh, we know that the school year, the new year is soon upon us, and I'd like to extend our best wishes as staff in the district to the community for 2022. And I'm happy to take any questions. And we do have one, one uh, question so far, Trustee Lyra. Uh, so you said is expected to resume in January, uh, but you're also recommending people take their supplies and personal belongings home. Uh, what is the likelihood, do you think, that school is not likely to resume in person come the first week of January? Thank you, Trustee Lara, and uh, we'll probably address yeah. that in the COVID update as well. Um, but in terms, of, I don't want to speculate uh, in terms of um, what is likely to happen. Uh, part of the preparation that we do uh, ask people to undertake is what we've always uh, asked people to undertake, and that is the notion that um, we could see a pivot um, of whatever kind um, coming into uh, January the 3rd. Um, what we are, are ardently hoping for uh, is that we will have um, a full system return. Um, and if there have to be some exceptions because of uh, areas where we do see uh, outbreaks or rises in numbers, that it will be isolated to particular schools or classrooms, but we would have no idea where those would be. Um, that is a hope um, that it, we are seeing a system return. Um, and at this point, um, all of the indicators that are coming back to, to us are saying we should be prepared for a full return. But that said, uh, we had the experience last year uh, where that was the hope going into the break. And during the break, there was uh, a reversal of fortunes, if you will. So we, we having learned uh, from experience that that could happen, uh, we want people to be prepared. All right. Thank you. And I see no further questions on the director's briefing. So Madam Director, if you would like to proceed with the COVID-19 update, please. Thank you, Chair Scott. Uh, and at this point, I will uh, call upon uh, A.D. Reynolds uh, to, and um, Executive Officer Jeru, as we usually do, to get us uh, going with the data, uh, as well as the uh, information uh, that is going out to the community. So, uh, A.D. Reynolds, could you uh, start us off with the uh, dashboard? Uh, and uh, we will have um, uh, Executive Officer Jeru uh, uh, in place as well to respond to questions as they come up. I'm not seeing A.D. Reynolds on my screen, yeah, and I'm, I'm, so I'm hoping I'm he's here. here. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm here. Okay. Uh, great. So if we can advance to the next slide. Uh, and I don't know if we need to make it bigger for folks or if it's just my view, but you can see that uh, cases have certainly been rising uh, across the district as they have across the city. Uh, and so have the number of outbreaks. Um, we still have uh, more resolved cases than active, but typically the active cases were not nearly that large. So we are concerned and public health has continued to monitor uh, how things have been evolving over these two weeks uh, heading into the, uh, into the winter holiday. Next slide, please. So as mentioned, significant increase in cases, uh, primarily in elementary, but we are starting to see more in secondary now. We have seen an outbreak in secondary, which is not something we've seen so far this year. It was a limited one, but still. Uh, increased number of outbreaks across the district. Uh, one school closed for two weeks. That was uh, Half Moon Bay in Barhaven. And the increase in case numbers reflects the recent surge in the community, as you're aware. Omicron is also present in the uh, community, and we're starting to see some of uh, those var that variant arriving in our schools as well. Next slide, please. 
We'll have a modified case management practice over the holidays. We're trying to provide some rest and relaxation to our principals and vice principals who bear the, uh, the brunt of that, uh, that process. However, they will still be available to support Ottawa Public Health in identifying high-risk contacts over the uh, closure period. Um, but people will need to be aware that uh, while those schools are closed and we are trying to find some uh, family time and downtime for our P's and VPs, they will not be available to answer questions uh, from parents in the community as they, as they typically are. Uh, people will have to rely more on Ottawa Public Health to address questions uh, that they have pertaining to their own uh, children or positive cases attached to their schools. Next slide, slide please. So Ottawa continues to lead the province in the vaccine rate for five to 11 year olds, which is great news. Uh, and hopefully we'll begin to see some of the uh, dividends from that in the, uh, in the coming weeks and months. Uh, vaccines continue to be available in community clinics and after school clinics continue. Uh, and we've seen decent uptake uh, at those across the city and between the four boards. Monitoring information about booster shots and definition of fully vaccination uh, will, um, will continue. And, uh, and hopefully we'll see uh, more and more of our uh, children and youth uh, be identified as fully vaccinated and, and better protected. Next slide, please. So uh, the provincial, uh, the Ministry of Education initiative to distribute rapid antigen screening kits will be distributed uh, at the end of this week. The intention is those kits are available for use over the two week holiday period. Uh, that is one of the reasons they have not been distributed before. So they aren't uh, inadvertently or accidentally used before. Again, uh, the ministry initiative is uh, attempting to provide some screening, voluntary screening over those two weeks uh, in order to support a, a safe return at the end of the holiday. It is voluntary. There is no monitoring. Uh, there is no returning of the kits once they've been used. Uh, you know, once they've been taken, I mean, uh, they're there for the, uh, for the students and the families to use. Uh, employees who are wishing to access uh, screening tests themselves uh, can do so through OPH if they're uh, symptomatic or identified as a high-risk contact. Next slide, please. Winter travel protocols, and even as this slide was written, uh, you may be aware from monitoring the media that uh, you know the, the federal government is considering new measures and is consulting with the premiers over the course of, I understand, today and tomorrow, so there may be new restrictions in place as of tomorrow. Uh, this is an area that continues to escalate, so I think the best thing we can say is uh, families uh, with students in our system or staff who are considering travel, international travel over the winter holiday, really need to pay close attention uh, to what is happening in this area as it may restrict their ability to return to work or school after the holiday. And it is continuing to evolve fairly quickly. Next slide, please. So just a reminder that our secondary schools will return to regular four courses per day uh, starting in February uh, with the start of the uh, what would be the second semester or uh, the second half of the year for our year long schools. Uh, there is a schedule being developed for the year long schools that is in the process of being shared. Uh, with uh, family and community, and we will answer any questions that are emerging uh, in that area. Um, but we will be returning, uh, you know, barring some other intervention to those four classes a day. Next slide please. Um, we were, as we uh, made it uh, abundantly clear when people were selecting in person versus virtual throughout the spring of 2021, we, uh, we will not be having an opening, an open period for switching between the two modes of learning at the mid year. Uh, if we did, that would lead to a reorganization across the system that won't be necessary, uh, but we will continue to uh, consider individual cases that come forward on a case by case basis, uh, where there is a, an exemplary need. Uh, typically, those would be needs that are based in the Ontario Human Rights Code. Next slide, please. So as the director had mentioned, uh, in preparing for the holiday break, we're encouraging people to, uh, you know, not only prepare to be with family and rest and, uh, and reset, but uh, to take home their personal belongings, uh, learning belongings, uh, key uh, teaching resources, materials, other work materials, just to be on the safe side. We've received no indication from the province or from local health officials that this is something that's being contemplated. However, cases are uh, continuing to rise. The new variant is of some concern. And, uh, and as the director had said, uh, over the last several uh, holiday breaks, you know, we, we have had announcements made uh, that did result in a delay uh, in a return to in-person learning. So we give this uh, guidance just just erring on the side of caution so that people are not caught in a difficult situation. Classes are scheduled to resume in person on January 3rd. Next slide. Any questions? And are there any questions on the update? Trustee Bell. 
Thank you, and through you, Chair. Um, thank you, A.D. Reynolds, for that update. I'm wondering uh, when it comes to the layers of protection for, for staff, um, and maybe this is a question uh, for the education director, whether it would be possible to revisit the requirement uh, to have fit testing done for um, masks that are more effective. Um, I'm asking given that uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada now um, recommends that there, there doesn't need to be fit testing for um, the community use of these respirators. Uh, the health sitting is a, a, different, um, a, a different case, of course. Uh, and given that uh, from, from information that I found uh, through um, individuals contacting me, that it's been a challenge to be able to access uh, that FET testing because um, the demand is is so great right now. Uh, thank you, thank you. Those are that's my question. Sure, thank you. It's uh, my understanding from the health officials with which we consult that, uh, for example, N95 respirators, uh, if they're not fit, fit tested, are no more effective than normal cloth face coverings, but uh, or large or maybe perhaps medical masks. Uh, but they're adequate for what is expected in the public. Uh, we continue to advocate, uh, you know, and follow the ministry guidance and, and public health guidance that the medical and surgical masks are, are not just adequate, but appropriate levels of protection. Um, reducing the fit testing requirement. I don't know how then that makes an N95 compared to say a medical grade mask, uh, but we can make that inquiry to see if, uh, if it would leave it at a similar level of protection. Great, um, thank you. I, I would very much appreciate that. I know that the, the evidence and the data is evolving. I'm no medical expert, but uh, following uh, the latest news and, and medical journals, uh, there there is, and especially um, with uh, Dr. Tam coming out and, and saying that this is going to be um, a very uh, challenging period on the horizon, it would be great if we could um, make things as, as safe as possible for, for staff and, and students. Thank you very much. Moving on then to Trustee Huff. Just a quick question. Um, when can we expect the update on the um, schedule in, uh, for the non-semester schools? When, when are you expecting to have that information ready to go to families? Uh, certainly before the end of the week, hopefully by within the next couple of days at the most. Are there any other questions on the COVID update? Seeing none, thank you very much for the update. And we will move on to matters for action, beginning with the confirmation of the board minutes from the 23rd of November, 2021. Do we have a mover? Trustee Jenikins, seconded by Trustee Campbell. Are there any errors or omissions in uh, these uh, draft minutes? And if there are none, I will call the question then on confirming the board minutes from the 23rd of November. All those in favor? And opposed? And the motion is carried. Uh, moving on then, uh, we also have the draft minutes from our board organizational meeting on the 1st of December, 2021. Uh, would someone like to move those? Trustee Blackburn, thank you. And seconded by? Trustee Boothby. And again, are there any errors or omissions in this set of draft minutes? And seeing none, I'll call the question on confirming the 1st of December, 2021 board meeting minutes. All those in favor? And opposed? And that motion is also carried. Is there any business arising from either of these sets of board minutes that is not already on our agenda? 
And again, seeing none, we move on then to item 8.3 on our agenda, uh, receipt of uh, the Committee of the Whole Report from the 7th of December, 2021. Vice Chair Penny. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I'd like to move a receipt of the Committee of the Whole Report from December 7th, 2021. Thank you for that. Um, do we have a seconder? Trustee Blackburn, thank you. And um, are there any errors or omissions in this uh, set of, uh, in this report? And I'm not seeing any hands raised, but I did have one, uh, one um, correction that I'm having, and that is on page 13 of the report. The references uh, in on that page to the amendment that was moved by Trustee Campbell, uh, which stay say be amended by substituting addition of non-voting representatives with change to non-voting representation. Um, it's, it's quite confusing because we usually talk about su substituting something for something else, or otherwise we should be saying replacing something with something else. So either way, it would be less confusing if that could please be corrected. We'll take a look at the language and. Uh, try and clarify. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, since there are no other uh, errors or omissions, I will call the question on receipt of this report. All those in favor? And opposed? And the motion is carried. So, Trustee Penny. Uh, that concludes. So there's no further business there, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, you have, I think, some recommendations oh, yes. to tell us. Yes, about. I do. Yes, there are some recommendations attached to that report. And um, number one is a uh, approval of the Vimy Ridge interim review. And there are two parts to that motion. Um, so part A, that the board of, or sorry, it's an abortion by, um, I can't remember which trustee, is this? Trustee was, Jenikins. I believe Trustee Jenikins. Trustee Jenikins, yes, which I will second. So that the board affirm, okay, it's up on the screen there. If you would read it out anyway, just in case people can't read the small print. No problem. So that the board affirm that a pupil accommodation review under board policy P118.PLG is not required for this study and part B, that the timeline and consultation plan attached as appendix B and C to report 21-097 be approved in order to consult with local school communities and the public. Thank you. Is this a consent item? If, if it is not a consent item, Please raise your hand. And it would appear that this is a consent item. So we will reserve it for uh, when we get to uh, when, when, when we get through the other motions to see how many others are consent. Trustee Penny. Yes. Uh, so uh, motion number two on a motion by Trustee Blackburn, which I will second. That the Ottawa Carleton District School Board approved the new electoral zone boundaries labeled Model 6 recommended model and attached as Appendix A to Report 21 093, which will come into effect for the 2022 municipal elections as amended, and Part B, that staff be directed to prepare and submit the trustee distribution and determination process based on this model and submit the required documentation to the Municipal Property Assessment Corporation in accordance with requirements of the Municipal Election Act and the Education Act and any related regulations. And I will ask if this is a consent item. Trustee Lyra, it is not consent? That is correct. 
So we will deal with that when we get to the non-consent items. And uh, the uh, back to you, uh, Trustee Penny, for the third recommendation. Thank you very much. And on a motion by Trustee Scott, which I will second. And we will need a substitute mover. Trustee Campbell will substitute. Thank you very much. So on a motion by Trustee Campbell, which I will second, that the Parent Involvement Committee appoint a non-voting represent representative to each of the Committee of the Whole and Committee of the Whole budget uh, until such time as policy p.010.gov community involvement on board standing committees has been reviewed. And part B, that there be a moratorium on any further change to non-voting representation at, at Committee of the Whole and Committee of the Whole budget, pending review and revision of policy p.101.gov. And part C, that as soon as reasonably can be done, policy p.101.gov be reviewed, reviewed and revised, such, such review to include consideration of the purpose for having non-voting representatives at Committee of the Whole and Committee of the Whole budget, criteria for the choice of groups to be represented, and expectations for the roles and responsibilities of non-voting representatives. Thank you. And just to make sure, uh, it is policy P.010 throughout, it, which is the only policy being uh, referenced in this. Is this a consent item? And I'm not seeing any hands raised to signify non-consent. Uh, so I think that we can proceed to a vote on the two uh consent items together if uh staff are able to open the vote on on both of those uh together And we actually have, have uh, the result for the first one already in hand. So are we actually doing them as two votes, Manager Guthrie? Yes, I'm afraid we don't have a method to do two at once. So I, uh, I will uh, declare that the uh, first motion with regard to uh, interim plans for uh, accommodating Vimy Ridge students, uh, holding the uh, approval of the consultation plan is approved unanimously, 11 in favor, none opposed. And now we'll go to the, the motion regarding the um, uh, community, the policy P.010 changes. And this motion is also uh, carried, a 10 in favor and one opposed. One Trustee, Trustee Penny, anything, anything further? I believe the vote was one abstention, not one opposed, Madam Chair. Oh, was that one abstention? Uh, could uh, staff please confirm? It should be one abstention, Chair. Justine Bell is yes. seen. Yes, uh, through you, Madam Chair, it is one abstention. Uh, I stand corrected. So 10 in favor, one abstention, none opposed. Thank you for, for uh, that correction. Uh, back to you, uh, Vice Chair Penny. Anything further in the report? Uh, no further items in that report, Madam Chair. That brings us then to the non-consent items, and that was the approval of the electoral boundaries recommended model, um, which was moved by 
Trustee Blackburn, Madam Chair. Trustee Blackburn. So I will invite you to provide introduction, Trustee Blackburn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Very briefly, um, again, I appreciate the, all the work that staff uh, did on this. It was It's a very complicated process, and I thank all my colleagues uh, for their questions and for Trustee Ellis's um, excellent amendment that we, I think, all agreed to. So um, I look forward to passing this quite quickly tonight. Thank you, Madam Chair. And a discussion on the motion? Trustee Lyra? I have spoken a number of times about how I do not feel elected officials should be drawing our own boundaries. I intend to abstain from this motion and that's why it couldn't be a consent item. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any wrap up, Trustee Blackburn? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, to my knowledge, uh, the city of Ottawa drew up the uh, ward boundaries, not us. Thank you. Thank you. So I will ask uh, Manager Guthrie if she could please open the vote on this. For you, Madam Chair, waiting for Trustee Campbell. And we have a result. Uh, the motion is carried, 10 in favor, none opposed, and one abstention. And that was the only non-consent item we had this evening. So that brings us to item 8.5 on our agenda, selection of a non-voting volunteer to the Indigenous Education Advisory Council, IAC, uh, which was deferred from our 1st of December, uh, 2021 board organizational meeting. And at the end of that meeting, I did uh, make a commitment to uh, do some consultation. Uh, and I have had an extended conversation with uh, Ms. Monique Monach, who chairs the Indigenous Education Advisory Council uh, regarding how to reconcile uh, our selection processes and, and the Algonquin protocols and the question of uh, undertaking revision of the policy. I should note that when the provincial government uh, indicated that every board should, should have an Indigenous Education Advisory Council to provide it with advice on Indigenous education, uh, the provincial government was quite silent in their statements as to who really took any, any resp the responsibility for uh, creating the committee or, or ensuring that, that it, uh, it functioned effectively uh, in partnership with the board. Uh, I take that to mean that the province did not see uh, any sense of, I suppose, ownership for the policy, but rather they saw it as an act of, of uh, conscious reconciliation to ensure that the Indigenous voice had the opportunity to come forward and partner with, with the board in providing advice on, on education for our Indigenous students and, uh, and about uh, Indigenous history and and everything else within the content and culture within the context of our schools. 
uh, which is very important. And that is an ongoing and evolving discussion uh, in which we very much value uh, the opportunities to hear the voices of our Indigenous partners through the Indigenous Education Advisory Committee. Uh, they have not expressed any particular concerns about how we go about selecting our, our representative uh, to that committee at this point in time. And I hope that we will be able to have a volunteer uh, come forward. At our previous meeting, uh, we had uh, two individual trustees who, who put their names forward uh, to, to uh, be the trustee for the Indigenous Education Advisory Council, uh, Trustee Huff and Trustee Trustee Ellis. Uh, Trustee Ellis did inform me this morning that he was uh, not going to put his name forward again this evening. Uh, and uh, he is also unavoidably absent uh, this evening. Uh, so the floor is open for uh, any trustee who wishes to volunteer to fill the one position. Trustee Huff? I would be honored to. Um continue to hold that position if that is the wish of the board. Thank you. Do we have a seconder for that? Trustee Lyra will second. Are there any other uh, individuals interested in putting their name forward at this time? And seeing no others, I will, uh, on behalf of the board, gratefully accept your willingness to continue with IAC, and I'm sure that uh, you you will uh, be a very good liaison with the committee for us. So, is there any? If there is nothing further on this, uh, I can advise that the discussions with IAC uh, regarding policy and Algonquin protocols will be continuing. Uh, it's it's a very important issue for all of us, and uh, I really look forward to our continued partnership with the members of IAC through the coming school year. Moving on then to matters for discussion, uh, 9.1, do we have a report from our uh, representatives at the Ontario Public School Boards Association this evening? Trustee Boothby? Uh, no report report tonight, Chair, thank you. And do we have any Ministry of Education update this evening, Madam Director? Uh, thank you, Chair, no, we don't. Our board work plan is uh, in included in our agenda as, as always, uh, so that trustees will see that we do have ongoing work to do. Uh, we will be potentially having a further professional learning uh, in January um, regarding Indigenous learning, understanding truth and reconciliation. And we have a number of key policies that will be coming forward to our meetings in the early part of, the, of 2022 for board approval, having been engaged in consultation for quite a while. Trustee Lyra? I was just wondering where the discussion about PIC and who sits at Committee of the Whole was going to sit on our board work plan if we had a projected month to get the community engaged for that conversation. At this point in time, we have not um, we 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 have not uh, determined a date for that. Uh, there is still a report to come forward with regard to how we're going to undertake uh, our um, policy review process, and uh, we we have still been working on that. Uh, we, ha we had an update on that in November, and I'm hopeful that we will have some further update uh, early in the new year. Okay, thanks. Anything further with regard to the work plan? If not, uh, moving on, uh, there are, I believe, no matters for information this evening. So, my next question is, is there any new business?
And I see that Trustee Bell has placed in the chat her message, Merry Christmas to all that are celebrating. And if there is no other new business, I will uh, second that thought and say Merry Christmas to all who are celebrating and to all a good night. We have completed our agenda and I declare the meeting adjourned. Thank you all very much and have a safe and restful holiday, everybody.